Good morning. Again, uh, like Scott said, my name is Mike Acock. I'm one of the pastors here. So if you're a guest, uh, great to have you here on the first Sunday of the year. Uh, our senior pastor, Phil Schaefer, is uh, with family this weekend. Uh, so as we uh, launch in uh, this morning um, to uh, a message to kind of launch our year, um, let me just share a story really quick. Uh, a couple weeks ago, um, we, Phil exhorted us to come forward at the end of a meeting, uh, those that wanted to, to, to pray, kind of stand in the gap for some, some women that missionaries in Ecuador that are from Christian Fellowship were going to be ministering to. They were going to be hosting Christmas parties in brothels in Quito, Ecuador. And we were standing here and going to, and going to pray for the ladies and the women that were in those brothels and, and just ask the Lord to speak. We got this email in that I just want to read to you. Um, this came over the holidays, and it just says, Good morning, pastors. I went forward this morning to answer your call to pray for the missionaries and the work God is doing uh, for the women uh, and the Christmas parties taking place in Ecuador. Uh, I think that's where you said it was. I don't usually step out like this, but I can't seem to let it go. I don't even know if you will be led to share this with, with the missionaries or have time to. That being said, during prayer, I instinctive, instinctively heard the name Tiana, that she's important. At first, my thought was that she is important to the work he wants to do there. But then as I continued to pray, I felt like he wanted her to know she is important to him. So what, uh, what this person doesn't know that gave me goosebumps when I read this email is that there's a girl named Tati, Tatiana, who's been living in Casa Dalia almost from the beginning. And so this is a woman whose body is wrecked from years and years and years of abuse. She has a self-image that's been really attacked, doesn't think of herself as important or loved. And so here we have a few people stand and say, God, would you speak to us? Would you touch these women? And her name is called out in our midst. And then we send this to Phil and Debbie, and they're going to get to share that with Tati. And this is a woman whose heart has been gripped by fear. Fear that she's not enough. Fear that she's not important. Fear that she's not loved. And if only for a moment, this story... This little moment that says, God spoke your name to a group in Columbia, Missouri. She's going to know that she was loved. And in that moment that she knows she's loved, fear has to do this. It has to let go. Because when you are loved, fear cannot hold on to you. However, often fear grips us and holds us and keeps us shrunk away from all that love would call us to. Let's pray. Father, you have overcome. You have done marvelous things in Jesus. You have expressed your love in a way that breaks through all darkness and brings light to our blinded souls. And so, Lord, as we step into this time, in this moment, would you help us, Holy Spirit, to hear what is true, to let truth grip us, the truth of our belovedness grip us, in Jesus' name, amen. I shouldn't start with such emotional stories. Uh, So it is the beginning of the new year. How many of you all made New Year's resolutions? Anybody? Yeah, a few? I've got, you know, I wrote down a few. Um, you know, maybe it's not a resolution, maybe it's more like a goal. You know, just, hey, I hope to do this this year. Um, those are all fun. Um, you know, I enjoy trying to do them. I really hate doing them because usually by January the 6th I've already broken them uh, and have not accomplished them. And so therefore I'm waiting till 2020 to do the rest of them. However, today 
is still a Sunday in the Christmas season. Today is the day of Epiphany. It is the day that we look for the revelation of Christ. It is the day we celebrate on Christmas Day Christ coming, but then we talk about the wise men coming and, and them going and seeking out the revelation of God through Jesus, this baby. And because we do it all at Christmas, we just let it go. But actually, this is the day that we're supposed to be talking about the wise men, you know, coming. Because it took some time to get there. And they sought out the revelation of what does it mean to have God with us, Emmanuel. And so when I think about the new year and I think about things and and I start contemplating the nearness of God and the, the nearness of God coming to us, I don't think resolutions and goals really always help me understand what's going on because usually what happens when I think about God being with me, I start dreaming. I start dreaming of things that don't exist and going, what if this year this happens? And what if this year this happens? And, I, and that's what I want to ask you. Are you dreaming? Have you let the nearness of God come to you in such a way that your heart has expanded and you believe maybe you could be a part of something happening that's never been before on the face of the earth? Could you think that way? Now, it's great if you do. But there's this thing called fear that usually comes pretty close right after you have that dream. Because as soon as you have that dream, you've got just about enough energy to start something. And as soon as you start something, something comes at you, and you begin to believe old fears or new fears, and fears grab a hold of your heart, and the dream starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. This is what I want us to talk about this morning. Three words. Fear... Hope and courage. I'm going to spend the most, most of the time on fear because I want us to actually understand fear. I want us to begin to understand what fear is doing and how it affects us. And then how does God bring us out of fear? Mother Teresa has a Facebook page. Did you, did you guys know that? <laughs> you can follow her. Uh, I follow her. I get her posts. They post like five times a day. So she's a busy woman in death. <laughs> Um, but uh, this, is, this is the one that, that struck me lately. It says, those who leave everything in God's hands will eventually see God's hand in everything. When we give everything to God, we begin to see God in everything. But when we hold on to things, which is often what we do, what is it that causes us to not leave things in God's hands? What is it that causes us to grab a hold of that thing that we trusted God with during worship? Because that's what happens. As you're with the people of God, we sing great anthems of truth. Our hearts begin to know their belovedness and we release things to God. And by the time you get to your car, you remember something that's probably going to be hard this week and you get gripped by fear and you go, let me have that back, God. I think I'll control that. That's what fear does. What blocks us from trusting that God is actually with us right now? What keeps us from going after those big dreams that come when we're close to God and we have a sense of Him? I don't think that it's lack of faith. I think it's fear. Fear is that thing that causes us to steal back those things we've trusted to God or causes us to shrink back from trusting who He is and that He is with us. You see, fear is this thing that comes right in our DNA. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, you'll see right before Adam says, I was naked, what's he say? I was afraid. We skip over that little line, but that is the basis of hiding. Not nakedness. Nakedness has its, I mean, it has its reasons to hide. But it's fear of being naked. 
That's a different place. And so in the fall of man, in humanity's DNA, in the fallen dark earth that we live in and that we were birthed into, we carry the DNA of fear. It is right here. It's right in our flesh to be afraid. It's what causes us to hide. It's what causes us to shrink back. But in the scriptures, it tells us that faith is from God. Faith is a gift from God. It is given to us. So if you have trusted Christ, if you have put your hope in Jesus, then faith has been given to you in your heart. And if it is in your heart, it is there. It doesn't just disappear because it's not yours. It's God's. It's His gift He put in you. And if we are new creation, which it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, then our hearts are ready to trust God. New creation hearts love to trust God. They love to exercise faith. But our issue is the fact that we exist with both. We have new creation hearts that are full of faith, full of trust, that want to grab a hold of everything that God wants. And we have this DNA of fear that exists right here in our life. Fear tells us that God is not with us. Fear will tell you that God is not for you. I had a few of those moments, actually, yesterday at the kitchen table, you know, trying to put this message together. There were some moments I was like, Lord, this is not coming together like I thought. And then my daughter comes in, and she has her little notebook, and she says, hey, just in case this would help you, and she throws it on the table with a little attitude, you know. She's 15. It's awesome. She says, here, I, I was listening to this thing, and here's some thoughts I had. I thought maybe it could help you. So I'm going to read them. It says Hebrews 11.11. 11. By faith, barren Sarah was able to become pregnant. Old woman as she was at the time, because she believed the one who made her would do what he said. So that's the verse she quotes. And then she just has two statements. It's because of Sarah's faith in God, not her hoping and pleading, she left it in his, in his hands. It's never going to be in our control. And I was like, well, that's an interesting couple statements. Maybe I should just share those tomorrow. Because fear won't let you do either one of these. Fear won't leave it in God's hands. Fear says, I have to be in control. As we consider what the scriptures tell us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and self-control, or sound mind. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But in the scriptures, we are exhorted time and time and time again to be strong and courageous, to not fear, right? Let me give you a couple. Deuteronomy Chapter 31, verses 6 through 8. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him inside of all of Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. And you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 46, verses 1 to 11. I'll just read a couple of them. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, 
though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Let me comment about this one just a second. Because when I think of goals and dreams and things that I want to do, um, sometimes I do crazy stuff like I'd love to run a marathon in the desert or I'd like to climb a mountain. And, uh, and usually it's because I've watched something on TV that was very inspiring and, and I was sitting on my couch, um, you know, with, with chips and a soda and, uh, and kind of enjoying the fact that I was in shorts and they were in like winter gear almost dying. Um, I, I wasn't breathing hard and they were on oxygen tanks. Um, you know, so, and, and you think, I got this, I could do that. When you're on the couch, holding on to your soda and chips, right? So, so when, when you are at the coffee shop and you're reading the scriptures and you're journaling and you're talking about not being afraid, that's a great moment. When we're sitting here and we're worshiping, uh, and we're all together, and we believe, I, I won't fear. But see, Psalm 46 does this. It says, our God is a refuge and a strength, a very present help in trouble. So therefore, I will not fear when the earth gives way. Think earthquake. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Think tsunami. Tsunami. Though its waters roar and foam and mountains tremble at its swelling. This is not about a moment of devotional thinking of saying, I will not be afraid. This is in the moment when your life is falling apart, you don't fear. When the actual earth gives way under you, you don't fear. That's what the Scriptures are talking about. It pulls us right into the edge of catastrophe. That's what the Scriptures are saying. I will not fear when this happens. And we go, how? How in the world does that work? This is what the Scriptures are calling us into. In Isaiah 41.10, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. In Isaiah 54, 14, it says this, In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. You shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. There are real places where dictators oppress people. Where countries are oppressed. But there are people in oppressed countries who are not living under oppression. Because oppression is a state of the heart. Oppression is this thing that says, I have owned fear, fear has owned me, and I am going to allow it to have control. When in our lives we allow fear to come upon us and grab a hold of us and actually be our state of being, we live under oppression. In 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. This is a spiritual thing. We have a spirit of fear, and there is a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. One is the Holy Spirit over here. The other is from darkness. The spirit of fear is real. So when you fear, or when you feel fear, it's real. And there is a spirit vying for your attention and your allegiance. But the Lord says, I've put something else in you. I've put something in you. A spirit, the Holy Spirit, my spirit, that is full of power and love and able to give you a sound mind. We could translate 2 Timothy 1.7 this way. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love. He has given you a mind that has been delivered, rescued, revived, salvaged, protected, brought into a place of safety and security so that it is no longer affected by illogical, unfounded, and absurd thoughts. That's what it means to have a sound mind. 
Fear does the opposite of that. But let me read this one more time. He has given you a mind that has been delivered, rescued, revived, salvaged, protected, brought into a place of safety and security so that it is no longer affected by illogical, unfounded, and absurd thoughts. That's what the Greek word actually means there. So how does fear work in our lives? Fear works this way. Beth Moore says this. She says, fear causes us to trade power for an overwhelming, pervasive feeling of powerlessness. Fear has to do with us not knowing the outcome of some situation. There are a lot of emotions that come along with fear. Anger, resentment, hatred, intolerance, depression, anxiety, unresolved grief. If those things are struggles in your life, you might ask a question, what's underneath that? Is there some fear underneath those emotions that is actually gripping your soul? So let me just give us a little physiological lesson, if you will, uh, on fear. Fear is actually something that God gave to us by design. It's a gift from the Lord in a human being, and it functions a certain way. There is a physical, physiological response to fear. Here's what happens. is when, let's say, a bear is coming at me, I have fear. Rightly so. A bear can eat me. So you should have fear. That fear does this. It takes all of my logical thinking brain, and it says, we don't really need you right now. We don't need you to think about the future. We don't need you to think about plans for tomorrow. We don't actually need to th you to think about anything. All we need you to do is give up all the blood up there and rush it back here. And it goes into this thing called the amygdala. And that amygdala then signals all these other things to happen, like adrenaline being released and cortisol being released in your body. And it shoves energy and power into your hands and your feet so that you can either fight like crazy or run like crazy. That's what happens. That is a gift from God. When there is a bear at your front, you should say, thank you, Lord, for fear, because it does its thing without you thinking about it. You don't have to think, hey, could you move some blood out to my hands, and could you move some blood to my legs so I can like fight and maybe move a little faster? You don't have to think about that. God's got it built in, built into the system. It just happens. The problem is, is that we now exist in a culture of fear. Everywhere we go, we live with fear. And we've adopted this culture of fear within our lives. And so everything that we do is fearful. And so you are constantly firing your amygdala. You are constantly shoving blood back to your amygdala. And it is like ready to fight or flight all the time. You can't have adrenaline and cortisol in your system all the time. There are medical studies now that are saying this is what is actually making people sick and weak. That actually hurts your physical body. So fear, when you let it just be and you adopt it and you say, this is what my life is, I'm just afraid. You are actually allowing physical damage to come to your body because we weren't designed to handle it. Our brains weren't designed to have all these chemicals running through it like this. We're designed to run from a bear once in a lifetime, hopefully. I mean, we're just not designed to do this every day. But you have to understand that's what's happening. That's why I want to spend this time on fear. Because most of the time we just say, hey, fear not. And you're like, okay, I'll try not to. And then the next time something happens, here's what fear sounds like. Hey, so I wonder if this is going to happen. And if that happens, I wonder what this is going to do. I wonder, I wonder if this is going to happen too. Oh, if that happens, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And, it, and you just go, like, it's like a machine gun in your head. And you have all these things that might happen. And at the end of the time, you're exhausted and you're wore out. Right? And if you're exhausted and you're wore out, and you haven't thought, when, those, when that starts happening, 
They have leadership lessons that they're telling people. When you're an executive and you're standing in front of a crowd of people and people start attacking you, you have to do something. Because as soon as they attack, your brain goes, oh, I don't need to think anymore. I know what I need to do. And they actually become dumb. Executives become dumb standing in front of people because all the blood leaves their brain and goes to their amygdala. And they're like, I just want to fight you or I want to run from this meeting. So they're saying, have a strategy. Have in your notes someplace where you say, what's five, plus, uh, five times five? Or what's you know, 125 times three? Do the math while you're staring at your notes. Because all of a sudden that sends a signal to your brain. Oh, wait, 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 I need blood. i got to think. And it pulls blood back out and you start actually having logical thinking again. That's how God designed it. So as we consider fear and the working of God in our lives, fear might actually be a place that we can look to and fear can teach us where we're not trusting. Fear can actually teach us and show us places to submit to God. To say, God, would you meet me here? I tend to have fear here. Every time I'm with a group of people, I think they don't like me. And I'm afraid I'm going to be rejected, so I actually never go and spend time with people. Lord, instead of me being in isolation, maybe I could ask you, could you help me know that I'm enough in you? And that I can just show up and be a part. There are four fearful assumptions. Lisa Rankin, who's a a medical doctor, has written a book called The Fear Cure. There's four fearful assumptions she says almost everybody makes. The first one is uncertainty is unsafe. Uncertainty is unsafe. The second one is I can't handle losing what I cherish. Number three, it's a dangerous world. And number four, I'm all alone. So whether your fear comes in other words than this, you could probably ask the question, are any of these four the basis of any fear that I have? And she gives four courage-cultivating truths to battle this. And she says this, uncertainty is the gateway to possibility. Do we not trust that God is ordering our steps? When I don't know what tomorrow holds, I can hope and trust that God is ordering my steps. Number two, loss is, an, is natural and can lead to growth. Does the scripture not tell us that we comfort people with the comfort that was given to us? If you've never experienced loss, you don't need comfort. Loss is part of life. It's not wrong to grieve. So we receive comfort and then we grow and we become comforters. Number three, it's a purposeful universe. The universe is not random. It's not going crazy. There is a God in heaven who is over all things and who is sovereign over all things and His purposes will not be thwarted. There is purpose in everything. And we may not see it now in our limited life, but if you're trying to define all of the purposes of God by your limited experience, that would be a mistake. And the fourth uh, courage cultivating truth is we are all one. In Christ, have we not discovered that we are actually connected and being built together as a church, as a community of faith, Fear is doing this to many of our lives. And what it's doing is it's not just your life, it's to your soul. And its hand is gripped so hard around because you've agreed with all of the fears that you've ever had. And so every time you turn around, fear is stirred up in you and it's affecting you, both physiologically, intellectually, and emotionally. And so to just talk about having more faith 
and not fearing spiritually is missing it. That's why you have to see all of it. God, who is the one who created us, knows that He created us human. And He addresses us and expects us to be human. So when you face your fear, when you see what's gripping your soul, hope begins to come if you turn to the Lord and say, Lord, this is what I'm fearing. Can I name it? And he says, I have a promise for that. And when you hear the promise of the Lord over your fear, hope comes. Hope is believing what's not yet been seen. In Romans chapter 8, it says, For in this hope we are saved. Now hope is, that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Isaiah 40, 31. Yet those who wait or hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Is that not understood that if you are being gripped by fear, weakness is coming to you? And then the scripture tells us that if we hope in the Lord, strength comes. Romans chapter 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. David and Goliath have a great story, if you will. Where we pick up that story of David coming along to Saul and saying, I will fight. I want to fight with my brothers who are the Israelites. When we pick up that scene, where are the Israelites? They are in hiding and protection and in fear of Goliath. He comes out and he taunts them every day and they shrink up every day a little bit more. And David comes and he he says, I believe God has given us this victory and he has hope in a promise that he does not see. And he comes out and, and that hope bursts in him courage and that courage to stand on the battlefield and look a giant in the face and go, I could die. But then he hurls a stone and it finds its mark and a giant falls. And then the giant's head is cut off and fear is transferred from the Israelites straight over to the Philistines. And they start running. If you listen to any stories about people who got the Medal of Honor in war, it is because normally in situations their men were trapped by fire and they were shrinking up behind a wall and they knew they were going to die and everybody knew they were going to die. And one person, one person says, if I charge into the face of my fear, it might change the course. And most of the time what happens is when somebody charges into the face of fear, the enemy gets afraid. And then courage comes in all these people Sometimes those men died, but they still got this medal of honor. Guys, we are the church. We are a church that lives in a world that is fallen and dark. And when we see hope of what could be, we can step in and go, I will face this fear. I will look at this right in the face. And when we, if one person does it, you'll be amazed. Because there will be people who will stand behind you because you will have brought courage into their heart. Hope is the birthplace of courage. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Don't be conformed to this world. This world is a place of fear. The method of this world is fear. It is, it's, it's in everything that we have. But it says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Renewing your mind is not simply memorizing more Scripture. I'm glad that we memorize Scripture, and we should memorize Scripture. It is 
a tool that the Holy Spirit uses for us in a day-to-day, moment-to-moment battle. So I am not saying don't memorize. I'm saying renew your mind is not just memorizing new scriptures. Renewing your mind is actually coming to terms with what's actually going on in your mind and saying, I'm going to stop letting fear have its way and I am going to let hope have its way. So as the worship team comes back up, I just want to share this thought with you. What are your giants? What giant is in front of you? What giant has a hold? What fear giant has a hold of you right now? Is it a giant that says, I'm not enough? Is it one that says, I'm not lovable? Is it one says, that says, I don't deserve to ever rest. I have to work like a dog. Is it one that says, I can't let my heart ever be broken again? Is it one that says, I can't allow anybody to see I'm limited? What is the fear that's gripping you? I know what it feels like to have your heart shrunk with questions of fear. Part of me ending up in a summer sabbatical in 2018 was because the questions that I kept asking and rolling in my head over and over and over had gripped a hold of me in ways that I didn't even understand. It was the questions of, am I going to be enough to answer the questions that are before us right now as a church? Will I be able to think creatively enough to help lead our church in the things that are going on that we're facing? Will I, will I not give up was a fear. And in the middle of that, my heart was just beginning to shrink. And you begin to stop asking dreaming questions. And you just ask questions of what will just protect what we have? What will just, what'll just maintain? And then things get smaller and smaller. And, and then you start asking questions that don't even pertain to what you're a part of. And you become angry and bitter and frustrated. These are real. Fear is real. But when you turn and you face them and you say, Lord, I don't know what to do with this. And he says, release it to me. I have a promise for that. And the one that you have to start with is that you are loved. So the fear that grips your heart, when your soul knows you are beloved, fear has to let go. Because a loved soul cannot be controlled by fear. Let's stand. When we listen to fear, we become hopeless, courage falls, and love is restricted. When we challenge fear, we embrace hope, courage rises, and love is released. As these guys lead us, what is your giant? Would you come? Would you allow the Lord to just speak a promise into your fear giant? Would you come and face and just say, Lord, I'm here. I don't want to be gripped by fear in 2019. As these guys lead us, you respond. Guys, come pray over people. Lay hands on people. Let's trust the Holy Spirit is doing something when we pray. We know that. You respond. Oh, one last thing. Somebody had a word uh, earlier during worship. God wants to heal dizziness and ear infections. Uh, He wants to open ears, um, literally, but also to His voice. 
So if your fear is I can't hear the Lord, that's you. Come up here. Why don't you come right over here and then, uh, uh, Tim, if you don't mind praying for them right over here. So if you come up and you come over here for uh, the ear thing, that would be great. All right, cool.